Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. The background of the club is fascinating. You'll read more on our website. Um, it's been a public service club since 1903. Non-discriminatory, open-minded, non-judgmental from unlimited varying views with the ultimate benefit being that of the public. We will continue to present international luminaries on every topic you can think of. And we really appreciate your support of all of our programming and all donations. When we reopen in our beautiful building on the Embarcadero, we will welcome you in person. We have an upstairs lounge where you can have cocktails and munchies and it's just an extraordinary way to spend a day or an evening. We have many upcoming programs. I encourage you to register for the following two. You'll find these on our website. On May 4th, Dr. Lehman McHenry will address the illusion of evidence-based medicine, distorted science in the age of big pharma. That is a huge topic. On May 25th, Dr. Ralph Moss, who is revered in the world of complementary cancer treatment, will address promising immunotherapies, those that went from the blacklist to winning the Nobel Prize. Questions will be able to be asked by members of the audience. And now today, I am so grateful to be able to present to you Dr. Shauna Swan. Dr. Swan, I know your appearance schedule with your new incredible book countdown barely gives you time to sleep. So thank you for making the time for our audience. So who is Dr. Swan? One of the world's leading environmental and reproductive epidemiologists. What does that mean? You're gonna find out. In fact, you're gonna be so empowered in the next hour, you will not believe this. She's based at Mount Sinai, an award-winning scientist and has more than 200 scientific published papers. Her findings, and also from the book Countdown, have been featured in worldwide media, including ABC News, NBC News, 60 Minutes, CBS, PB, PBS, BBC, NPR, and leading mag magazines and newspapers around the world. Newsweek, The Washington Post, USA Today, The Guardian, Bloomberg News, Chicago Tribune, newspapers and media in Europe, incredible. And Dr. Swan, before you proceed, I just want to thank you again because your work is Nobel Prize worthy. <laughs> Everything is so disconnected in this world, it's hard for people to get true information with the implications of what that information is on their lives and the lives of their children and their grandchildren. You have brought it together in your book. And I think of your one book as an encyclopedia of books and books and books. There are not enough ways that we can thank you for bringing this true science forward in a way the public can understand. Your work will change the path of humanity if people take action. It will support all living creatures and mother earth. And I am so very grateful that you've agreed to speak with us. So now I would like you to address for the audience what your background is and how you became interested in this work. So first of all, Adrian, thank you so much for that incredible introduction and I can't possibly live up to it. That's the only problem with it. Um, but um, I'll just tell you briefly um, before I start my actual talk is <clears throat> that I am basically a Californian at heart. I came out to California to go to graduate school um, I got my doctorate from Berkeley, and then I, after some other jobs, I joined the California Department of Health Services, where I served for 17 years. And in that capacity, I was able to help, I think, uh, the citizens of California um, deal with problems of environmental pollution and particularly their effects on reproductive health. So I'm happy to say I'll be coming back to California. I hope to look forward to working uh, more closely with my colleagues in California and looking forward to being there. Well, come on over. <laughs> yeah. Before you begin, because I believe most of your work focuses on endocrine disruptors and our audience, though very well informed and curious, I think they need to have a foundation of understanding what an endocrine disruptor is. 
So I'll be talking about that in some detail, but let me just say overall, endocrine disruptors, endocrine hormones disrupting, interfering with our hormone system. So chemicals that have the ability to get into our bodies, interfere with our body's endogenous hormones and change the way we develop uh, and function. Um, there's a huge class of them and they're in all of us as I will talk about. Okay, then why don't you just take it away and we'll sit back and learn. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Adria. So <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is threatened reproduction, the causes, consequences, and solutions of these threats. Um, and I'm very happy to be here today at the Commonwealth Club of California, able to present this information to you. So, uh, okay, for some reason, there we go. So here's a roadmap to what I'm going to cover today. Um, I'm going to talk about the problem that we address in Countdown, some causes of these problems, consequences, and some solutions. This is a lot to do in 40 plus minutes, and I hope you'll read Countdown and learn more in detail about the problem, the causes, consequences, and solutions. So let's start with the problem. I think the first part of the problem is that it's not very well recognized. Unlike these people in NASA scientists and workers who are gathering around these computers, recognize Houston, we have a problem. That kind of awareness is not, has not until now, I think, been brought to the problem that I'm going to address. And I hope when you leave, you will have some of this uh, attraction and this intensity, and you're viewing the problem that I'm going to present. So really the start of Countdown was the article that we published in 2017, um, which I'll talk about in some detail. That paper, which talked about the decline in sperm count, was had received global attention, such as this cover of Newsweek, there's some mistakes in it, though, because it isn't just America sperm that's at risk. But let's go back. This was not the first study at all on declining sperm count. The one that came to my attention and perhaps the one most well recognized before our 2017 paper was this paper that was published in 1992. And this came from Denmark, which is a leader in this area. And um, they announced that there's been a genuine decline in semen quality over the past 50 years. And you see this graph, and by the way, the circles, the size of the circles represent the studies, the size being actually the log of the size of the population, but never mind, it's just bigger circles, more information, if you will. Um, when I saw this, I have to say I was skeptical. And many people were skeptical. And I thought, well, I don't know. There's not that much data here. It's kind of spotty. Maybe there are biases and confounders that could explain this, such as what if they used a different method of counting sperm in 1990 than in 1930? And so they introduced something that counted fewer sperm. That could happen. Or maybe the men who participated were different. So that men who participated in 1990 actually had intrinsically lower sperm. Maybe they were men who were going to infertility clinics and so on. So then there are things of like obesity and smoking and alcohol and all of these things that might in principle explain this decline and flatten the line. So that's what we epidemiologists like to do. We like to take results and say, how can we make this go away? And so I tried. And I tried for six months, actually. I got the 61 underlying studies and I pulled out of those, all these factors, and I put them in a big model and I ran that model. And what I came up with was, wait for it, exactly the same decline. This was absolutely stunning to me. I couldn't change this with any of the variables I could think of, nor could my colleagues. And so I decided I had to take this seriously. And I did. And I embarked on 
if you will, a detective story that I'm still following right now. And the detective story is what's going on here and why, okay? So I published a series of studies on the left is the study I just showed you, the Carlson study. In the middle is my study of 2000, which was not the initial one I talked to you about just now. It's a later one in which I separated studies by geographic region. But if you compare the slopes there, if you pooled those three regions, you would see that the slope is about the same as Carlson had found. And we had more studies in ours. We had 101 compared to 61, and we went further in both directions, and we couldn't change this story. So fast forward to 2014, when a colleague of mine and I were talking at a meeting, and he said, we should go back and look at Carlson again and see what's happening. Update that, right? And let's do it better, and let's do it bigger. And so we did. And so we did the largest meta-analysis on this question that's ever been done. We got a librarian, a reference librarian who was wonderful, who found us 7,500 studies that have sperm to clown in English language papers that we could use potentially for this analysis. Well, you can't use them all. And one of the things we wanted was that the method of counting sperm was constant through our whole study period. So we only use studies that use the standard WHO method for counting sperm. And we wanted the men to be comparable across the whole period. And so with these various criteria, we went from 7,500 to 185. And that's what happens with meta-analysis. Most of the studies you initially you know, pull out are not gonna be helpful, but these were enormously helpful um, and they allowed us to see what's in the right-hand figure. Now that's complicated and I haven't defined what, what the colors are very clearly perhaps. So I wanna separate the red line is Western men and that's North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand. And the, um, I actually have to get my legend here. And the um, fertile Western men are in green. So what's the difference between fertile and unselected? Well, fertile, those are men who are fathers and they're gonna have better sperm no matter what because they're fathers. So we analyze those separately. The unselected men are men who didn't know their fertility. So they couldn't have been from infertility clinics. They couldn't have been at sperm banks. They had to be unselected men. And so the two Western lines are the green and the red. The other lines are other countries. And sadly, we had very few studies from other countries. So we're be going to be updating that and hoping to get more information. But for now, we're gonna concentrate on Western countries and particularly unselected men. So if you break out this line, which is the line for Western countries, unselected men. I want to point out a few things. First of all, our study period is really 1973, the start of the sample collection, not the publication, sample collection, because we're really talking about samples here, not papers. And the start in 1973, the sperm concentration, and let me just define this on the side for you, concentration is sperm per milliliter, count is the total number of sperm in the sample. So count is concentration times volume. And we report on both concentration and count. Okay, so here we are, the count in 1973 was 99 million per milliliter. And this is a really robust sperm density or concentration, okay. If we go to the end of our study period, the, when the last sample was collected, 2011, it's down to 47. Now, first of all, you should note, this is about a 50% decline in something under 50 years, <clears throat> actually 39 years. <clears throat> so this is a decline that's about 1.2% per year. Let me just say 1% because that's easier to remember. So it's going down at 1% per year. And 
That doesn't sound like much, but last data, 2011, where are we now? 2021, 10 years later. If the decline has continued over these past 10 years, and all evidence we had was that it was, we are now at 37 million sperm per milliliter. Now you could say that's a lot of sperm, who needs that many sperm anyway to conceive a baby? <clears throat> the point is that when you go below 40, the chance that you conceive a pregnancy goes down and it goes down in every cycle. So 40 is kind of the cutoff between fertile and subfertile. Then below 15 is called infertile, okay? So we're entering that area between fertile and infertile right now. We also looked at the decline for the past 30 years. So did it slow down? No. 20 years? No. 10 years? No. We saw no evidence that this was tapering off, okay? So here's tapering off in blue and orange. Here's continuing the line. I want to mention that the bottom here is zero, and that would mean zero median sperm concentration. That actually can't happen because what's the median? It's the middle of the distribution, right? Half or lower, half or higher. We can't have negative sperm count. Doesn't exist. So what has to happen, this is going to have to level off. But how quickly? That remains to be seen. Okay, so these are problems in men. There are other problems in men. And by the way, sperm count doesn't totally characterize a semen sample, of course. There's the shape of the sperm, the motion of the sperm, the chromosomal integrity of the sperm. All of these things are tested in a sperm bank. Um, but there are other things that could go wrong, and I'm going to talk about some of them. But I just want to point out reduced testosterone. Testosterone has also been going down and about the same rate as sperm concentration and count. Genital birth defects have been going up at about the same rate as these other changes. Females are also undergoing changes. I'm not gonna talk a lot about females, but I want, we do in the book have a, a lot of discussion about females. I just don't have time today, but I wanna point out that these problems that I've listed here are also increasing. And the surprising thing is that they are increasing at a similar rate. So if we look at the, here on the left, we have sperm concentration in Western countries. And then in the middle, we have the world. So Western world. That's from the World Bank fertility data, very reliable data. And what they show is that number of births per woman or couple has decreased also by 50% in about 50 years. Same rate of decline and really alarming because this number 2.4 where we are now in the world and under that by the way uh, in the US of course just something out today about the low fertility rates in the US um 2.1 children is how many you need to replace yourself okay so we call that replacement and many most actually western countries are below replacement and some Asian countries are as low as 1.0, which has never been recorded in history. So we are at unprecedented low rates in some countries of the fertility rate. If we look at the miscarriage rate, the data are more limited, but the increases in miscarriage rate are also at about the rate of 1% per year. So what are the causes of these changes? I'd like to talk first about what are possible causes. So possible causes are arguably broken down into genetic and environmental causes. These changes of over two generations are much too rapid to be evolutionary. And I think we can agree that we can put aside genetics, although genetics can interact with environment to cause changes. Um, but now if we focus on environment, I'd like to focus on chemical exposures and lifestyle exposures. And in particular, I want to just say a few words about lifestyle factors, because that's not the primary focus of my talk. 
but they're certainly important for reproductive health. So here are some examples of lifestyle factors that can influence your sperm count, influence your fertility. So one of those is diet. I think people are pretty familiar with this. And a lot of these, by the way, are things that you want to worry about for your heart health as well. So fatty diet, um, processed meats. Um, then there's binge drinking. Um, and I want to mention that several of these actually have a sweet spot. So drinking is one of those with a sweet spot. A lot of drinking, not a good thing, but a certain amount of drinking is probably helpful. And that's true for your heart as well. Stress, probably, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stress is not a good thing. Good luck controlling that right now in the time of COVID, but it certainly plays a role on your fertility and sperm count. And heat is actually something that's particular to sperm count. It does lower sperm count. Counts are higher in the winter than in the summer and so forth. Um, obesity, we know, is a risk factor. And there again, there's a sweet spot. Very heavy, very thin, not so good for reproductive health. Couch potato behavior, never a great thing. So now I'd like to focus on chemical exposures. And the chemical exposures I'm interested in, Adri asked me about this at the beginning, are those called endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs. Why am I studying those? I'm studying those because I'm concerned, and I have been concerned for many, many years with reproduction. And our reproductive health and development depends on hormones in our body, which can be disrupted by endocrine disrupting chemicals. So I'm going to show you some examples. There's some listed down here, the phthalates, bisphenols, the PFOS, the pesticides, the flame retardants. So here's an example of a PFOS, a flame. this is a Teflon line pan, which you would like to avoid, I suggest, um, to keep these chemicals out of your body. Here are some rubber ducks, which are made soft and squishy by phthalates. That's what one of the things phthalates do. They make our plastic soft and flexible. And then there's flame retardants, um, which um, are risky as well for reproductive health. Pesticides, which I studied extensively, bisphenols, which line tin cans and are also in cash register receipts, surprisingly. And then I wanted to point out another application of phthalates, which is to hold color and scent. So they're in cosmetics and they're in personal care products. And they're actually also in fragrances because they retain fragrance. So here's just a picture of some of the things you can try to keep out of your life if you want to decrease your exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals. I have to tell you, and I'll go into this in more detail, that the majority of these chemicals have not been tested for safety. And this is an old picture, but it's an old story. And the story is that we are in some sense, like these animals in cages that are being exposed to these chemicals were part of this massive experiment that we not, did not give our permission for. We did not agree to be tested. And that's what happens. The chemical is put out. Then scientists who have the money and the time try to conduct a study to see if it's harmful. This is not good for our reproductive health. And the, the growth of these chemicals, particularly plastics, has been enormous. And I just want to point out briefly that this was can be dated back to the end of the Second World War in the, in the early 50s, when our society was enamored of science and plastic, um, better living through chemistry, plastic, important part of every diet, I have an ad that says. <laughs> um, and um, they were embraced and grew at this tremendous rate, uh, despite the fact that they were not tested for safety. So now I'd like to hone in on a specific story to give you, a, if you will, a case in point. And at the end of the story, I think you're going to see 
how one class of chemicals can affect one aspect of reproductive health, namely sperm decline. So go on this journey with me, which took me about 20 years, but I'm going to summarize it for you here pretty quickly. Okay, so just a bit of biology that reproductive development depends on hormonal input, and particular on testosterone. So early in pregnancy, the human fetus is has undifferentiated sex organs. They're the same in males and females. Under the influence of testosterone, the genetically typical male develops in the way we expect a male to develop generally. And the default is female. So if there's no testosterone or very low testosterone, then the female genitals will emerge. And that will be the case if there's no programming to make a lot of testosterone, that will be a genetic female. So what are chemicals that can interfere with testosterone? Well, remember the phthalates in nail polish, in our shower curtains, in plastic tubing. There are not all phthalates, but three in particular, and now more are being developed as substitutes, by the way, for the ones taken out as risky. Um, and these phthalates are, um, have the ability, they're characterized as anti-androgens. Anti-androgen, testosterone is an androgen. So that's what they are. They are androgen lowering, and you might expect that they could interfere with fetal development in males. And that's the case. So here's an example in a rodent study from 2000 in which an unexposed mom, had her pup has a testosterone surge at a critical window in pregnancy. But when the mom is exposed to one of these antiandrogenic phthalates, then that peak is gone. It's gone when the phthalate exposure is in those days. And that peak is essential, as I showed you, for the differentiation of the male organs. There's other things that happen when the mother is exposed. For example, in this example, DEHP, diethyl hexyl phthalate, the pup, male pup will develop what's been called the phthalate syndrome. This is kind of remarkable. If you look it up, there's not other chemicals that have a syndrome named after them. That's how definitive this is. There is, by the way, fetal alcohol, but that's somewhat different. Um, so what is the phthalate syndrome? Well, it's basically incomplete masculinization of the ma genetic male offspring. Let me say that again incomplete or arrested masculinization of the genetic male. And here are some things that can happen. The penis can be smaller or malformed. The testicles can be undescended. And finally, there is this shortened intergenital distance, which is something that's been very important for my work. It actually was known for about 100 years to be very different in males and females. So. I want to digress and just tell you that this image of rodent pups inside the uterine horn is really critical to this discussion because these little guys, if they're male between two females, they're not going to be completely masculinized. That's because they're not getting, they're getting a little bit of estrogen. If the female is between two males, she'll get a little bit of testosterone. And what's critical here is not the particulars of the development, but the amount of testosterone that's transferred. And this is important because people say, well, low doses of phthalates that we get through our food and through our products, they can't be doing anything. That's way too little. But in fact, it's not. And this is, uh, I'm going to show you what it can do. So the anagenital distance reflects how much testosterone there is in that little, in the, in the uterus, in the horn of the animal, or in the uterus of the female woman. And it is, look here, look how long it is in the male. And this is how short it is in the female. This is a, in a rodent, but it's also true in a human. It's true in almost all mammals, by the way. Not hyenas, but almost all mammals. <laughs> and. 50 to 100% longer. So it's the clearest marker of the genetic sex of the animal at this time, right? And it's been known since 1912, and it's been used 
to figure out whether a chemical is a reproductive toxin since 1998, but it hadn't been used in humans for what I call human toxicity testing. Could we use it to assess whether phthalates affect human reproductive development? And that's the question I asked in two large, very expensive studies. So again, I'm just stressing the amount of testosterone that you need to make a change is just a drop in a swimming pool or a drop in <laughs> the uterine environment. And so I asked, okay, if the mother is exposed to phthalates, would her child have these changes that we saw in animals? How do you do that? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. You have to have pregnant women. You have to get their urine at the right time in pregnancy. You have to send those samples to a lab that can measure phthalate metabolites because phthalates are water soluble. They go into the urine and then we can measure them. And then you have to look at the babies. And so it wasn't really clear what you should look at in these babies because this had not been done. This experiment has not been done in humans before, but we figured that out. And we did bring the babies back who had been born to women in another study for which I had saved the urine and was able to measure phthalate levels. And what we found was that in humans, we confirmed the phthalate syndrome. So we did that and published that in 2005. It was pretty impactful, actually. Uh, it, I think it did influence the Consumer Protection Act of 2008 and got people to start using less of the phthalates we had named as harmful. We did another study 10 years later, published 2015, in which we replicated this entire study. And our conclusion overall from this body of research is that the phthalate syndrome, prenatal phthalate exposure causes the phthalate syndrome in human males. I use the word cause deliberately here because this is something that was shown in animal studies. It was also consistent with mechanistic evidence from um, in vitro studies, and it was reconfirmed in, an, in, a, in a second study. And it's been reconfirmed, by the way, in other studies around the world. So yes, phthalates cause the phthalate syndrome in males. And HED, it turns out, is a good marker of androgen exposure, even in females, but that's really another story. But I haven't gotten to sperm count, have I? This doesn't tell us anything about sperm count, this is babies. So how would I go to answer, answer the question, do phthalates affect sperm count? So bear with me here, have to digress and tell you that HED is actually a permanent marker. Um, we haven't shown that conclusively, although there's a lot of evidence for that in humans, but it has been shown in animals. And it's, you know, in toxicologists say HED is forever. It's a marker, just like a small hand or whatever other physiologic feature you have that increases with your age and size, but you're always going to have small hands if you're born with small hands. It's kind of like that. And so we could go to adults and ask, well, is the intergenital distance in an adult male linked to his sperm count, right? So I did that study. Uh, I did it in Rochester, New York in 18 and 19 year olds. And what we did was we brought them in and we asked them to give us a semen sample and to allow us to measure their anogenital genital distance and their genital area. And what we found was that the shorter the anogenital genital distance, the lower the sperm count. And by the way, this is 25 is pretty low. That's concentration, I should say. We count as, as well. 25 million per milliliter. Remember I told you that 40 was an area a point to be worried about? Okay. So you see with these short anogenital distances are associated with very low sperm count, concerning sperm count. And a colleague in California uh, did a similar study in which he also found this result. And he also found that um, infertile men had a shorter anogenital distance. And then other studies show that boys born with 
undescended testicles or malformed penises also have a shorter antigenital distance. So what's happening is there is a disruption that's caused by phthalates in early development that has a spinoff into all of these areas. But the timing of this is really critical. I want to take a moment to stress that. Um, I think you saw in that park study that there was a narrow window for exposure to decreased testosterone. And that's been pinned down as called the male programming window in rodents, and it's actually just three days long, surprisingly. So if you give phthalates only very early or only very late, you won't see those changes. For humans, we didn't have that fine calibration because we couldn't assign a period of exposure, of course, ethically to women, um, but we could get their urine at different times. And we got it three times. And so what we showed that in humans, as in rodents, early pregnancy is the time that's most risky for the exposure to these chemicals for their effects on male reproductive development. There's another way that timing matters, and I just want to break out of that AGD story to tell you this. Um, it turns out that exposures during pregnancy, or by the way, that the father experiences prior to the time that he conceives the pregnancy, it's a 70 day window that his sperm is being produced. In that window, if he smokes, then his son has been shown in several studies to have an increased um, have a decreased sperm count of about 40%. That's a huge reduction. And if the mother smokes also early in pregnancy, her son will have a 40% decrease in sperm count. That's permanent, permanent. That cannot be altered. That's a developmental change. However, if the man spoke, smokes himself, his sperm count will also go down, not as much. And if he stops smoking, the good news is he can recover his sperm count. So for all of these endocrine disrupting exposures and all of these outcomes, you want to know when was the exposure? Was it at a critical time? So now I'm going to talk about some of the consequences that I haven't already talked about. Um, and one of them is kind of surprising to people, which is that low sperm count actually is associated with earlier death shorter life expectancy. Um, that's because of increases in heart disease, uh, reproductive cancers, diabetes. Um, and it's pretty dramatic. Um, and it occurs whether or not the man had a child. So a man who had a child doesn't have his risk of death increased as much as a man who ha has a man who has had a child doesn't have his risk of death increase as much as a man who has not had a child, but any man who has a sperm count below 40, remember I told you 40 was a cutoff? Below 40 is going to experience a higher risk of death, earlier uh, mortality, which is pretty important and makes me suggest, and other people suggest that everyone should have their sperm count checked. So you have this information, just like you learn your cholesterol and you learn your blood pressure. Some people call it the sixth vital sign. And I want to briefly acknowledge the huge impact of these environmental chemicals on the reproductive health and survival of multiple species around the planet. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about this and maybe you'll invite another speaker to talk about this. I wish you would because this is a terrifying and hugely important story. We're not alone on this planet. What we experience, they are experiencing. And finally, I, in terms of future consequences, I want to point out that when the mother is exposed or the father is exposed, it's not just the parent parental exposure or the F0 exposure that's important. That is also affecting the fetus's health, of course, and we've seen that, but it's also affecting the germ cells that are within the fetus that will give rise to future generations. And groups and the University of Washington have actually tracked this seven generations. So we're not just exposing ourselves with the harms in our environment, we're exposing our children and our grandchildren are possibly their children as well. So the consequences are huge. And 
So we have to turn this curve up. We have to stop this decline as quickly as possible because we are now very close to, if not below 40, which is the point at which we are going to be shortening our lifespan. And by the way, lifespan has already decreased a little bit in this country. And um, what can we do to, to make this happen, to avoid this scenario? So what are some possible solutions? First of all, I wanna point out that it is possible to turn this around. And this was shown in a beautiful study in the University of Washington by Pat Hunt, in which he showed that when the father was directly exposed, this was a mouse and he was exposed to an estrogen genic compound, um, that he was impaired, his reproductive function was impaired, his testicular health was impaired. The son was only indirectly exposed in the way that I showed you in that diagram. But then the grandson was unexposed to any future exposure in the environment and she took great care to keep everything clean in the lab so that they had absolutely no exposure and then the great grandson was unexposed so from here to here she said we can turn this around in three generations i believe we can do that for humans as well but we really have to get busy because three generations in humans is a lot longer than three generations in rodents. So here's some of the things we have to do. I didn't talk to you about regrettable substitution, but I experienced it in my studies um, when the most heavily used phthalate DEHP had dropped by 50% in my second study 10 years later. That was great. And then I found out that other phthalates had been put in, which can also alter AGD and other changes I've showed you. Bisphenol A bottles, bisphenol A free, you seek out those bottles, you're not told that they contain other bisphenols like bisphenol F or bisphenol S, which have the same harms as bisphenol A. So we call this regrettable substitution or whack-a-mole and it has to stop. And we have to test, we have to test the God knows how many chemicals, I've seen 60, I've seen 80 <coughs> that are in commerce that have not been tested. Um, they were grandfathered in when Tosca came in and we just don't have the wherewithal, the power, if you will, uh, but we have to, we really have to test these because right now a chemical does not have to be tested for safety before it's put into the marketplace. In Europe, it does. And there, <coughs> the good news is that um, they ban 1,100 chemicals from personal pro care products in Europe, in the EU. In the US, they ban 11. So we are not very well protected in this country. So here are three lessons I have for you to take away, if you will. First of all, we have to remove these hormonally active chemicals. They are not good for our bodies, our reproductive health, and actually, other aspects of our health as well. We have to remove those chemicals that cause harm at low doses. Remember that drop in the swimming pool, the drop into the fetal environment. Those are harmful. We have to stop those from doing harm to us. And we have to remove those that are environmentally persistent. We haven't talked about persistent chemicals, but there are there's a legacy of persistent chemicals and we can't keep adding to that list of chemicals that are going to go into our soil, go into our water, go into our food, and then into our bodies. And we have to not use chemicals that are untested. Instead, we have to replace them. And this is kind of common sense. Following the first one, they have to have no endocrine disrupting effects. They have to have no low dose adverse effects. They have to be minimally environmentally persistent and they have to be safe prior to marketing. This is a really, really critical one. And we have to regulate at the scenarios to which we're exposed. And this is not currently done. We are exposed to low doses. We have to test at low doses. We're exposed to mixtures. We have to test mixtures. We have to look for environmental persistence and we have to test those chemicals that are still, even at this time, untested. So I want to thank my funders, 
for all of these studies and for the staff and for the participants who have been thousands actually. Um, and I'm ready to ask answer questions and remind you that if you want to learn more, you should buy Countdown and you can uh, find it in any of your local bookstores. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn this over back to Adria for the next phase of our nice um, session together. My goodness, Dr. Swan, we have a lot of questions. <sighs> this information is powerful. I'm a cancer consultant. Cancer is a symptom I always look to cause. Low sperm count is a symptom. Let us look to cause. You addressed some of that. What lifestyle changes can people make? Or do they also go to reach in Europe and find out what chemicals are they approved that they could look for? How, how do they address this in their lives on a daily basis? So, um... There are, I think the first thing to do is to just be aware that any product, man-made product that you bring into your home has the ability to contain these chemicals, which might be harming our hormone systems. And that includes foods, it includes furniture, it includes personal care products, and so on and so forth. They're everywhere. Um, I would start with food if I were doing a cleanup because most of the exposure to phthalates that we get is through food and a lot of most of the exposure to phenols is through food. And how does that happen? <clears throat> well, it can happen in the processing of the food, the packaging, the wrapping. They can happen in our homes if we were to cook in plastic, which I hope nobody here would do. <laughs> Microwave in plastic, absolutely not. Um, because what happens when you warm up plastic, the phthalates and the phenols are not chemically bound. And so when there's more activity from the heat, they leave the plastic and they go into the food. And then of course they go into us. So food, I would be really, really careful. And to the extent that you can afford it and that you can take the time, unprocessed food is the, undoubtedly the safest. And I would say the absolute safest would be unprocessed organic food. So there you avoid the pesticides as well. Um, if you want to ask about a particular product, you can go um, to a number of the resources that we have in Countdown um, and look up these particular products or look for recommendations for safe cosmetics, personal care products, laundry detergents, cleaning products, and so on and so forth. Um, oh, and one other global recommendation is, is scent, smell. Try to buy things odor-free. Um, not fragranced because fragrances contain phthalates. So whether it's a perfume or it's a soap or it's something to you hang in your car or something you plug into your wall, don't do that if it's gonna contribute scent to your environment. What about organic essential oils replacing different scents like in fragrances, for example? I don't know, Adria. I haven't tested that. All I know is that when we asked women to tell us what they used in the 24 hours before they gave their samples and they listed all these products, we asked them, did they contain fragrance? And when they said yes, then we saw an uptick in their phthalate levels. Yeah, absolutely, no doubt. Um, in terms of tin cans, Right, so many people buy foods in tin cans. I recall, because I've been looking at your work so extensively, the linings of the cans, was yeah. that was the issue? The linings, yes. And actually linings in general are should be worried about. Um, so linings of tin cans usually contain bisphenol A, although some eco-savvy manufacturers now recognize this and there can, will be labeled BPA free. I'm a little nervous about that because it's not labeled bisphenol free. And as I mentioned, you could have another bisphenol in there, which is also harmful. So just be wary of, of tin cans. And I should mention other coatings while I'm at it, the coating on nonstick pans uh, is risky. The coatings on our water repellent garments are risky. The coatings on papers that keep out oil, oil from seeping fluid, like in a pizza box are risky. Any coatings. 
My goodness. That begs the question of our skin being the largest absorption organ. <laughs> our clothing with dyes. I remember <laughs> hearing that you could wash something four times and you still have the dye seeping in to your skin. Do you have any information on that? I don't have information on dyes. I've never studied dyes. It's a really good question, though. Um, I, I think it's something I should be looking at. <laughs> but um, uh, I know that absorption through our skin is one of the major routes through, through, through which we get exposed to these chemicals. So it's, you know, think about the three major routes are ingestion, food and water, dermal absorption, and Breathing is really important because dust contains a lot of these chemicals and more and more as we, um, you know, for example, roads have um, all kinds of endocrine disruptors in them ground up into the into the surface of the roads and when cars go over them, this uh, these chemicals are emitted and we breathe them. We breathe them in our homes and use a good HEPA filter, by the way, and take your shoes off at the door so that you don't bring the outside dust into your house. Why? I mean, this information <laughs> has been around for so long. Finally, you put it all together for us in one place. Our health budget in the United States may be close to defense. It's undermining our country. Why is this information <laughs> not more widely known? I need you to talk to legislators, Adrian. You make a great case. <laughs> um, so why is this not better known? I think, well, first of all, there are obviously a lot of forces that want to keep things as they are. Economically, it's a viable enterprise, isn't it? Um, and by the way, it's totally enmeshed, linked to petrochemicals because these chemicals, phthalates and so on, plasticizers are made from petroleum byproducts. So the enormous financial engine behind the petroleum industry is also driving this industry. Okay, so think about the forces you'd have to change to change this picture. It's enormous. But I think we have to do it because otherwise not only animals are going to be going extinct, not only wildlife are going extinct and Mother Earth, right. right, about which we need to thrive. So let me be very, oh gosh, direct. That's the only way I know how to be. I'm from the East Coast. Financial interests are driving the lack of information, correct? Certainly in part, and people are not demanding it. So they're pushing, they're resisting, but we need a much stronger outcry. We, I am trying to get people outraged. I want to increase the outrage factor and I want to increase our ability to talk about our reproductive problems. Just focusing on reproduction. I mean, will a man in a cocktail party talk about his low sperm count? I don't think so. You know, is a woman gonna talk about her two mis three miscarriages? No, she's embarrassed about it. She feels bad about it. And by the way, women have borne this burden for much, much too long. It's an equal opportunity <laughs> enterprise <laughs> making a baby and, and having a baby come to term. So I, I think that we have to, as we're more enlightened, recognize that um, this is something we have to have a conversation about. We have to have a public conversation about this. Be able to talk about things like sperm count and even penis size and anogenital distance. You know, I hesitated talking about this at first in public, but it became clear to me that I had to because otherwise how would people understand this? So let me put you on the spot. Okay. Do you have some play. Yeah, that's part of the beauty of working with you. You said I could ask anything I needed to. Right, right, right. Thank you, right? right, right. Bring our audience right here. Right. <laughs> Do you have a blog, a petition, something where people can go perhaps on your website and say, we want change? Something that allows them to take action in a unified way, focus, to support you and what you're trying to achieve. Adrian, you're a little, it's a little early. <laughs> In, in the sense that I am in the process of developing what I'm calling the countdown action campaign. Mm. But until we lay that out, 
um, I don't have that, but there are many environmental groups and we list resources in the book that people can turn to. They can donate money to these organizations. They can offer their time to help, you know, get the word out definitely, but it won't be countdown specific. Nevertheless, it'll be very valuable, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I ask people to use the hashtag. If you do use social media, hashtag count me in as an indication of support for what I'm trying to do. Ah, and for those of us who are not social media savvy, where does that hashtag count me in go? You just go right to it and say, I support you? Um, you can do it on LinkedIn. You can, you can do it on Facebook if you still use Facebook. Um, there are a lot of social platforms you can use it on. Okay. Um, uh, you can um, go to shawnaswan.com and you know, there are a lot of resources there that you can hook into. So, um, and you can send me a question at info at shawnaswan.com. Brilliant, great. I, uh, you showed the fish, right? Mm -hmm. And it was mortifying to me. I saw a movie where they opened the stomachs of the fish and showed these little pieces of plastic. So what you're talking about is also threatening our food supply, not just from the organic that gets contaminated, but also from the oceans, right? From our, from basically our sustenance. So, I mean, I have plastic bags that I have washed 300 times and they're still there. So in terms of empowering our audience, which is one of the objectives of all the people who come to speak at Commonwealth Club, like your information empowers our audience we can do things, we can take action, we can watch the chemicals, we can see what we're putting on our bodies, we can see what we're putting in our environment and what we bring into our homes, we can rinse out those plastic bags and use them over and over and over again. So actually, I'm not sure that's a great thing, Adrian. I would- Ah, tell me. Yeah, because um, when you um, wash plastic and reuse it, it it cracks, it degrades. You, you know, when you look at, at old tiles, old PVC tiling, you mm -hmm. can see that it loses color, it cracks. That's because the phthalates have come off of it. So using chem plastic bags makes, and washing them and handling them makes the phthalates come out of them. So I, I would suggest that we do reuse things, but we reuse ceramics and glass and metal to the extent that we can. Oh my goodness, then what do we do with all those plastic bags? They're going to- Well, try not to take them home. Try not to take them home. Yeah, there we go. Um, is, is, there, is there, in addition, in your book, you have a list of the chemicals to avoid, right? And with phosphenol A, I call it bait and switch. I yes. really, tell us, just please, just to emphasize, when it says BPA-free, we're looking for something else that's just as or more harmful. Would you tell us the name of that again, please? Well, the class is bisphenols. Okay. And that you can have any, not any, but a number of alf letters after that. So alpha, it's like alphabet soup. You've got bisphenol A, bisphenol F, bisphenol S. And more studies are coming out now showing that the substitutes, which are not A, are having some of the same risks or even greater risks than A. So really what the manufacturers should have on those bottles is bisphenol free. Then you can breathe a sigh of relief. Okay. Unless they put in something else with, with a different name, which is possible, okay. you know. Um, would you address farm to table? Uh, Did okay. you know, I, think, I think you were gonna do a study. Oh, farm to fork, is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just so, to get people excited about the future of what you're doing? Okay, well, um, I'm in the process of designing and getting funding for a study, which I'm calling um, Farm to Table. The name Farm to Fork is taken, uh, so I'm going to call it Farm to Table. And the idea is that if you measure the chemical content of simple vegetables or fruits or other products at the farm, um, like a tomato, and a head of lettuce and a milk in a pail and so on and so forth, maybe a dozen of these, <clears throat> test them right there, test them in an organic farm and in a traditional farm, and then follow them from the farm to the table. So they go 
into a package, that package goes into a truck, that truck goes to a factory, that factory, the food is taken out, it's processed through a processing machine, and then it's rewrapped, you know, maybe it's put in a bottle or it's put in a can, goes to the store, goes to the, our table, and then we can test it. So in principle, you could identify the entry points for um, the uh, chemical in, uh, how the chemicals come into our products and, and how much. So that once we know that, we can say, ah, oh, this step, this is where this comes in. Let's eliminate that. And then we can keep our food safe. That's the goal of Farm to Fork. I saw a note that saying, somebody saying we're at time now, so maybe we should honor that and, and, and wrap up. Well, I have one more question. They allowed us one more question that's hanging out there. Um, when women are in a dormitory together, their periods get in sync somehow. When people are around other people who have high chemicals in them, is there any way that's being transmitted into the other people through their breath or is there a problem there? That's I, don't, I don't know of any, I don't know of any. And remember, if you wanna find out what's most risky, it's during pregnancy. Uh, okay. So there is that transfer, but it's much more intimate. It's from the mother to the fetus or from the father to the fetus. Absolutely brilliant. I, I'm going to probably put your book in my bedroom. So I read a few pages every night again. <laughs> Dr. Swan, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your life-changing comments today. Um, thank you, I hope our, you, you are so welcome. Our audience, I hope you share this widely because we're talking about the present safety as well as the future safety of our generations. Very, very important. I also want to take a moment just to thank our staff because we have gone from an in-person format to a virtual format and they have handled it brilliantly, working crazy hours, figuring it all out and making presentations such, of your, such as yours available. We thank our audiences. We thank those listening to the recording and please know for future programming, we have our Healthy Society series in the Health and Medicine Committee. We have extraordinary people just like Dr. Swan in their fields coming in so right now, thank you all for being here. Thank you again, Dr. Swan. And the Commonwealth Club meeting is now being adjourned. Thank you. Bye now.